I don't want to go. I will speak about the notorious, the famous, or infamous of us, uh, H index. If you are Nobel Prize winner or fifth Prize winner, it's obviously uh, you, you, you paid. Uh, nobody doubts your achievements. But for the rest of us, mere mortals, we like to rank ourselves. And in 2005, a physicist called uh, Jorge Hirsch came up with a very widely used today. And if you go to Google Scholar, you immediately find what you worth, how much you worth. So if one number, of course, it's very obnoxious to rate one person by one number, but then, and Hirsch then what is they call it, the age index. It's a very widely cited paper. So he got at least one. <laughs> but <laughs> the age index is that another name for something that existed at least 120 years old. It's called the size of the Dalphi square of the Okay, okay. partition. So before going to talk about the things that was about 10 years ago. And let me go back to Euler. Because the idea of Hirsch is not the total number of citations that you have. Of course, you can say I've been cited, if all my papers together, I've been cited so many times. So he claimed that this is not a good index. Because if somebody right wrote a million, a many, many papers, but each of them have been cited once or zero. <laughs> he had lots of quantity, but not very much quality. Nobody cares uh, about uh, to cite it. So that's one extreme. If we have n publications, n citations, and n papers, and each of them, okay, suppose that you get cited at least once. Each of them gets cited once. So this is one extreme. The other extreme is you are like Grisha Perlman or uh, other uh, Gödel. You only have, in the most extreme, you only pu publish one paper, but very, very influential. They have been cited uh, 10,000 times. So according to this, these two extremes, lots of quantity, but very little quality, and here, very little quality quantity but not the quality get the same age number one. Yeah? And you cite your own paper. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that too. That too can tell you. <laughs> and very soon, if title meeting, I tell you an algorithm how to improve your age index. Unfortunately, for better or for worse, you are measured by age index. So whatever you do, if you want to be nice to me, do not cite my most cited paper. Uh, very soon and also do not feel bad for my least cited paper. You should go somewhere in the middle, you should go to my, my own age index, I'm going to be 33. So go to Google Scholar, look at the 33 most cited paper that has exactly 33 citations, and go one beyond it. See how many? First add one more to this one, so cite this one, and then paper number 34, that so only had 32 citations, Cite it twice, and then you make my day, you will improve my age index. And then you can iterate it, and uh, you can make a deal with other friends. I increase your age index by with you increase my age index, and it protect, and you can always make up an excuse why it's relevant in this paper. <laughs> so, but before talking about the age index, let's retrace to Euler. So the idea of uh, your guess here was, to look at you, uh, make a diagram. Your most cited paper, suppose is uh, N1, uh, C1. The second most cited paper, and put it here. The, the third cited paper, and here he discovered really the notion that goes back at least to Euler of integer partitions. And, so, and this is called the Ferrat diagram. And I'm sure you didn't know about it, but it was noticed later that this notion really existed. So, given 
the Ferrari diagram, you look at the largest square, it has to be a square, that fits in the diagram. So this is called the size of the Ferrari square. And that's a nice thing that came up from Sylvester's attempt and his goal to move combinatorially partition identities, a theta function identities. Uh, it was part of analysis, and you had lots of so-called Q series, and one of the be most beautiful, go back to Euler and Lagrange, was the following one. This is a generating function, by the way, for integer partitions, this infinite product. And for a good reason, when you want to make an integer product, you make a decision. How many ones? Maybe no ones. Zero ones. Or one one. Or two ones. Or three ones. Or four ones. This is the first decision you have to make when you make an integer partition. Then you have to make a brand new independent decision. How many twos do you have? Is there no twos? Or one two? Or two twos? Or three twos? And and then you have another decision, and so on. How many series? And each of them is a geometric series, and if you then look at the coefficient of q to the power n, then everything will be connected, and you get exactly the number of integer partitions of n. And that's why we get the generating function of Some stupid people, oh, thank you, have this in front. They think that every infinite series has to be a, con a convergent series. So they worry about convergence. But it's much more rigorous and much more elementary also to think of it as formal power series. It's just a way to crank out as many coefficients as you want. Obviously, if you only want the first 1,000 coefficients, this term is not relevant. So you have only to expand this, collect terms. This is not the best way to crank the first 1,000 or first 10,000 terms, but it's a way. And later on, maybe I mention another way. So this is, goes back to Euler. And Euler and Lagrange apparently found, using analytical methods, the following beautiful identity. That the generating function for integer partitions is given by the following infinite sum. K goes from 0 to infinity. Q to the power k square divided by 1 minus q times 1 minus q square times 1 minus q to the power k quantity square. And they had some complicated proofs, and Sylvester's student. Uh, Dalfi uh, came up with a beautiful elementary commenter proof of this identity. It's so beautiful, I can tell you uh, in one second. And then go back here. So you look at the typical partition. The left hand side is a generating function for all partitions, the coefficient of q to the power n in the formal power series expansion with the width Taylor expansion of this is P of n. So let's look at the Ferrari diagram and a typical partition. So this is and then let's try starting at this corner to have a sequence of squares. So this is still on, this is still on, you keep going until the last time it actually completely fits into the diagram. So you can fit a 4 by 4 square here, but not a 5 by 5, it sticks out. So this is K, the size for every integer partition, 
This is the size of the Delphi square. So for any specific k, let's count the generating function for this architecture. It's either k plus 1 or, or either k plus 0, that's the empty partitions. But if not the empty partitions, uh, at least k plus 1, then for this partition, uh, gamma is k plus 1, and so on. So let's look. Obviously, the inside square had already k square dot c. And now that you know that there are k by k, you look what happened on the right hand side was and what look what looks happen, what, what happens below. That's a partition and we, it could have I mean it's okay to have this. And this can have at most yeah, that, that's okay still. But this is not okay. So this is a partition with at most k parts. So either one part, two parts. So obviously the generating function for the height is this part. It's the same analogous thing, but the largest part is k. And similarly, the number of parts here is k, but you can do the conjugate, so it's the same thing. So that's the proof. Much faster than Euler and Lagrange had, and it's beautiful. So this is how the original one. And then in 1998, three smart people, Rodney Canfield, are really a probability whiz. Rodney Canfield and Carla Savage, who is penalty the secretary of the American Mathematical Society. And at the time, a, a master student, who is now a famous commentarist, uh, Sylvie Cortier. They, they studied these statistics, the Dorfi, side of the Dorfi spell, for its own sake. So it's some random variable. Every partition of side n, so the sample space are all partitions of side n, had a certain size of the Dorfi spell. Question. What is the average a size of the Duffy square? What is the time deviation? And they worked very, very hard and proved an amazing result that this random variable size of the Duffy square, so k of p of partition, is what's called asymptotically normal. First, they found by very, very delicate analysis that the expectation of k. The sample space is all partitions of side n. And they found a beautiful asymptotic formula. It's asymptotic. Everything is asymptotic. And a savage, and I mean, can't, can't fit. A savage found out the following beautiful formula that the expectation is this nice constant, square root of 6 times log 2, log of pi, I don't know why, very complicated, I have to confess, I don't have the patience to read the very, very, very complicated uh, things, and probably nobody did, <laughs> I, I, I think when the country did, and uh, I think Cortina did other parts of the paper, but not this part, so my guess is only country, uh, but I believe him, he's very liable, <laughs> so he proved this, when n goes to infinity. So that spell of n, it makes sense. They are trying to do spell of n. Of course, it has, and the least it can be is a spell of n. So, no, the least can be one, sorry. The most it can be is a spell of n. The extreme is that you are very, very mediocre, and all you, you published spell of n papers, and each of them have been cited spell of n times. So this is extreme. So of course it's less than square root of n, and it's more than one. It's somewhere between one and square root of n. So this, and this is roughly in floating point 0 0.540446. 0 so this was the formula for the average. And then in the same paper, they also found an asymptotic expression for the variance. And the variance, 
So the second moment after we say normalize in front end is uh, etc. is another more complicated constant, but in floating point it is a one. In particular, notice that you have concentration of measure. Most permutations are near this, because like with the coin tossing, the variance is proportional to the expectation, and uh, the constant is much smaller than this. So the standard deviation is much less uh, asymptotically. So it gets very constant. So there are very, very few partitions that have a very, very large a relative close to square root of n or very small if you look at the random partition. So this, this. But they even prove also using very complicated things that it's called asymptotically normal. So as n goes to infinity, it's like a bell curve. So if you plot all the partition, uh, a histogram of all the partitions uh, versus the, how many uh, the size of the dumping square, uh, it's it's picked around this, and so it's some some vector. So it's called asymptotically normal, and they work very hard. Beautiful paper, but apparently Jorge Hirsch was not aware of the connection to the dark square, and he had no clue about this paper when he did it. So it so turned out that if we take in, uh, in the, a month ago in the notices of the American Society a very nice uh, article by Alexander Young, a commentarist at the University of Illinois, he took Martin Champagne, critique of Hirsch citation index and commentary family problem. And then he mentioned, uh, and he did a statistical analysis, and it looked like that the real data correspond very much to random things. So most fist analysts or ordinary mortal, you just go within the normal thing. In other words, you don't need the H index. If you know the total number of citations with very high probability, there's a confidence interval, uh, it falls in the confidence interval uh, for, for these things. So instead of the Hirsch index, we can just take as a measure the number of citations, take the square root, and multiply by 4, 0 0.5, and then plus or minus, and, and you get a very good prediction, with a few exceptions. And then it, it can probably explain why you, uh, you, you deviate from the norm. So it's, there was a, basically a, the critique. But I came along. And I have to confess that I, I already told you I don't have the patience to read very, very intricate probability with very hard analysis, with lots of estimates. Uh, I don't have the patience. I guess if somebody uh, told me that I have to do it or has to shoot me, uh, I have the qualification to study it and be able to understand it. But short of uh, having, uh, I, I rather do many, many unpleasant uh, shows like this CAC, CAC 1, or even pre-calculus, then having to go through this very, very hairy, hard analysis of country that I admire, but uh, it's not for me, it's for somebody else, uh, really. But nowadays, we don't need Rodney Kansas if you are not uptight about absolute rigor. You have experimental mass, and you have the shortcut. So let me describe how I reproduced this is that, not exactly, even this. And this is that, and the fact that it's asymptotically normal. So this is my approach called symbolic uh, moment calculus. And often it can lead to rigorous results. And a few years ago I talked about it in the seminar. But it can also be used completely naively, completely empirically, with the power of computers. So it's a hard way. Some people are extreme. For example, Stephen Wolfram in the New Kind of Science said, formulas are out, theorems are out, let's simulate, let's launch computer simulations, let's do Monte Carlo and find out. So that's a little bit too extreme. 
You can use computers a little bit more cleverly and to get what I call semi-rigorous design, not a simulation. And because simulation also, you have to do many, many experiments. The convergence is very, very slow. So here is my approach. You have, again, so let's do it with a very simple example, coin tossing. So you coin a toss, you toss a coin, and time. So it's either you have a head or a tail. So let's do the number of heads. So you look at the so-called combinatorial generating function. So you have some random variable. It's called piece of empty. For example, you toss a coin n times and you count. So the number of ways, the coefficient of t to the power k is exactly out of 2 to the power n coin tosses that you did. Uh, the number of ways that you get exactly k heads. So this is the combinatorial generating function. So under the uniform distribution, you can do, sorry, that's the combinatorial. Now the, the probability generating function, you simply divide by the number of elements. So in this case, it's to the power n. And you get the probability generating function. And now, of course, if you plug in t equals 1, the total probability, the coefficient to the power k is the probability that you get exactly k process. And now, we can compute the expectation. The expectation, the average, is simply the derivative at 1. So we take the derivative. And you turn the computer for this one, I admit. You plug in 1, and lo and behold, you get n times 2 to the pi minus 1. Yeah, n over 2. So we got a closed form expression for the number, the average number of heads. If you toss a coin, a fair coin, a fair coin, you can also do it with a loaded coin, and p plus 1 minus p, and, sorry, 1 minus p plus pt, you get p times n. But let's keep it fair for now. So that's this. So now you know the average, but then you have to centralize it to look how it deviates from the average. So let's call it up. So in general, we have the, as a normalized, the centralized probability generating function, then the next process. So you divide by t to the average and get the centralized. So t and t dot t. So it's p and t divided by t to the average of n, average of n. So in this simple example, it is 1 plus t to the power n, or to the power n, divided by t of n over 2. But now you can find the second moment. The first moment of the centralized one is easy. Thank you. What's the answer here? What's the if you centralize it, what's the answer? What's the why to centralize a random bubble? What's the average? So zero. Very good. <laughs> if you centralize, it gets zero. So this is already zero. And you can also multiply t here. Because t times one is zero. To get the second moment, you can do this. And here you can easily get closed form. And you get also n over 2. And in this case, the one has np. And you can keep going. And so m sub k of n is this, that the case moment about the mean something. You can easily, a computer can do it very, very fast. Divided by factorial k? Uh, uh, no, no. No, no, 
Ok, en ce moment. Non, non, il est un moment. Non, non, c'est vrai, c'est vrai. Parce que, non, c'est toujours. Le sigma, il est ok. Il est pas ok. Et. So is it, you get sigma for k to the power m, okay, not k, okay. You sub r, this is r, dr, and, and then, no, every time you do t over t, you get r, a power of r. The operation is here, it's all decentralized. Maybe you could feel the moment, uh, mm -hmm. then it's right. No, no, it's right. Anyway, the computer can easily do it and get a close form for this, for any specific k. As k gets 100, you get a huge polynomial of degree 100 and not do close form. But what you could easily do uh, is get the first few terms. And then the next step is to get the so called standardized moments, also known as the alpha coefficients. So alpha sub k of n is the case moment about the mean divided by the standard deviation to the power k. So there's a variance to the, uh, to the power k over 2. And now, if this is a sequence, and now you make the limit, and I go to infinity of these moments, and it still turns out, it's an easy thing, first empirically, but in this simple case, you can do it completely rigorously. You can get the first few terms in the asymptotics, and the computer can then prove it uh, by induction, and this is one of my previous papers, and then you can get a close form for the first asymptotic, the first, the leading terms, and any number of terms you want. And if there is a limit, it's called there is a limiting distribution. And many, many, many times, in particular with coin tossing, it goes to the famous bell curve. And if this happens, it's called asymptotically normal. It's not always. Some distributions do not contain, uh, some sequences of combinatorial uh, and the variables do not uh, converge to the, but most of them do. And whenever they do, it's called asymptotically normal. And people make a living by doing a like Cranfield, taking this and very, very intricate analysis. It's a paper that uh, usually is in a good quote unquote journal that, that you can publish uh, uh, to pull some money. But it's a very good shortcut. So in this case, it will be done completely rigorously and because it's so simple, this is very simple comment to a generating function. And often, and you can also do many things. So this could also be fully rigorously, but sometimes the combinatorial generating function is so complicated, it's not like this, one with plus to the power n, it's something far more complicated, then you need a Rodney Canfield, the patience and the skills uh, and the virtuosity of Rodney Canfield and <laughs> at least two months of uh, time, of uh, time, of body Carter's time, to do it completely rigorously. And in about half an hour, I can produce what Rodney Carter did. Not rigorously, I admit, <laughs> but so what? <laughs> very, very convincingly. So if you do it not rigorously, but just do this process, you can get very, very good approximation and then fit it and prove asymptotic normality. And reminding you, the moments of the Gaussian distribution, famously, if it's odd, of course, it's zero, because the symmetry, the delta moments of the so-called Gaussian distribution. If it's even, it is one times three to the last times two minus one. So the sequence of moment is one of course, zero, three, zero, five, zero, fifteen, zero, one hundred five. This is the sequence of moments 
of the Gaussian or normal distribution. Should this one yeah. be there? Oh, sorry, 